what I like to focus on f from a radiation oncology standpoint is, is uh, toxicity. Um, because we know all of us as radiation oncologists that treat prostate cancer uh, and other cancers as well that there is a very heterogeneous response to radiation in terms of toxicities. You can give two patients uh, the exact same treatment and they will have very different responses. So uh, a number of years ago with our radiation biologist Barry Rosenstein, we set out to really um, to try to figure out genetically what was going on with patients and why some were at greater risk for certain toxicities than others. So uh, I just want to start off um, kind of going over uh, one of the original art, art, uh, articles that kind of uh, got us thinking about this stuff, uh, or came out actually while we were doing it, which was basically a New England Journal of Medicine article looking at uh, the prediction genetics that could predict uh, for being diagnosed. This came out way before the test that you've heard about today. But basically what it showed was that there was a, a, a risk ratio of 16 tested SNPs, um, which were uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, that had increased risk of developing prostate cancer. And the key was that when you put these various uh, mutations together, and especially when you added family history, you had a, a much greater predictive test. So for instance, if you had a family history of prostate cancer and you had uh, four or five of these uh, SNPs that were identified, uh, you had a, a relative risk of, of developing prostate cancer of 4.5. Um, um, and it only applied to a small percentage of patients. And then uh, essentially when, so, so the reason I brought this up was that what, what I'm gonna show you over the course is that when we're dealing with trying to predict patients for radiation uh, sensitivity, it's not going to be one genetic thing. It's going to be, as uh, we heard from the prior speakers, uh, multiple uh, mutations that are going to predict and our ability to screen uh, the entire genome will be the best predictive uh, assay for us. So what we started out at Mount Sinai was looking at a disease where we knew there was enhanced, a known uh, history of uh, marked enhanced radio uh, sensitivity, and that's in the uh, disease ataxia telangiectasia. So if you were, um, if you had both of the mutations for this disease, for this, for the, for the ATM. Uh, you had the disease, and this was just a, a, an article uh, from 1968 that basically described giving a relatively low dose, uh, obviously with uh, uh, much older techniques, to, to a patient's uh, uh, chest wall and, and to the anterior portion of their chest at around 3,000 centigrade, and clinically uh, watching this patient develop severe radiation reactions and eventual death from that. And that was uh, in a patient that had ataxia telangiectasia. So we hypothesized that it, if perhaps someone was uh, a heterozygote for that, so they were all counting one of the mutations, that, that may, they may be uh, at an enhanced risk for uh, re enhanced radiation sensitivity. So we know that radiation ionizes molecules in the human cells, uh, and obviously DNA has been known for quite a while to be the primary target. Um, what do we know in terms of radiation mechanisms? It's biologically and physically predictable, and we have specific techniques and, and outcomes and, that we could produce from one institution to the next. But despite knowing that, and despite having normal tissue toxicities as radiation oncologists we all learned about during our residency, we know, as I said earlier, that um, even keeping within those guidelines, you would see unpredictable side effects. So this is just a slide that shows the number and the type of ionizing radiation-induced lesions in the DNA. So these are the type of lesions that radiation causes in a cell, and that's double-stranded breaks, single-stranded breaks, base damage, sugar damage, DNA crosslinks, and DNA protein crosslinks. Uh, and you can see that the most common uh, a type of changes that radiation induces is really with uh, single-strand breaks, base damage, and sugar damage. So we have certain mechanisms uh, to repair damage from DNA. And, and they, although they're extremely effective and efficient, they're not always successful. So you can have some DM, DNA damage, and the cell can respond in a number of ways. It can, a normal tissue, for instance, can uh, accurately repair that damage. The cell can survive. There can be a misrepair with a, 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 a genetic mutation that, that that the cell continues on with, or that can be absolutely failed repair, which we hope occurs when we treat cancer with death of the cell. So there were two approaches uh, to consider when we were trying to find 
uh, certain candidate genes that might predict for uh, adverse response to radiation. Uh, we could take a theoretical uh, uh, approach, which is trying to understand the mechanisms perhaps involved in causing the uh, radiation side effect and trying to track down that, or we can take a practical one. Uh, and the, the practical one is really what we started to do uh, at Mount Sinai. Um, and we had known prior to doing our research that there had been certain um, candidate genes that had been described that had uh, relationships to radiation response. So this is TGF beta 1, SOD2, XRCC3, XRCC1. These are just, uh, and you could see the, uh, some, of, some, some of the things that these genes are responsible uh, for. So we knew that there were some of these genes, including the one I had mentioned, which is ATM. And we also, again, from a prior publication uh, from Eric Hall uh, at Columbia University, that there was a relationship with the, a the ATM heterozygote among prostate cancer patients uh, with severe late responses. And this basically showed that have, being a heterozygote for this gene predicted for enhanced uh, uh, late toxicity. So there, there was some evidence uh, for that. Um, and then we decided to focus uh, the, at Mount Sinai uh, because that was our clinical interest in brachytherapy because we found that it was, it, it was something uh, that was uh, – that, that it was very reproducible. We could also have a variation in doses that we were receiving. So again, these were some of the unique qualities of prostate brachytherapy as a model. Again, we delivered very high doses to the prostate. Um, there was some variation in the dose symmetry, the dose to normal tissue, such as the, the bladder and the rectum. And we, we started to observe when we, uh, observe when we did this that we definitely did see toxicities, namely urinary, sexual, uh, rectal toxicities. Um, and also, we know from prostate cancer, most, case, most patients are, are cured uh, when they're treated, and they live a long life. So they live a, a life long enough to manifest some of the toxicities. So this is kind of one of our early pilot studies that kind of looked at the ATM uh, sequence variants and how they predicted for adverse radiation toxicities. So if you look at the, um, the table on the bottom, the things that we looked at was a decline in the uh, sexual health inventory, uh, which is a patient-reported uh, sexual function questionnaire. Um, also, we assigned the Mount Sinai erectile function score, and we looked at a decline in that score, as well as we looked at uh, rectal bleeding as measured by the RTOG grade 1 and 2. Uh, and what we did find was that the ATM alteration was the single best predictor of developing uh, those various toxicities. We also did another validation study. What a validation study was is so we tested this on a number of patients, and then we basically went to a other, another group of patients, completely different, to see if we had the similar findings. Um, and this was basically looking at the mutational status of a number of patients. And, and one of the things we looked at in this validation cohort was looking at rectal bleeding. So this graph was from uh, one of our original papers that looked at the effect of radiation dose uh, uh, and correlated it uh, with the amount of rectum that received a given dose. So what we found in this original study from 2001 was that as the amount of rectum uh, that received the prescription dose, which was an iodine implant of 160 gray, increased in, C in cubic cc's receiving that, that the incidence of rectal bleeding increased. So you could see that if, you're, if the amount of rectum that received the, we call RV100, was less than 0.8, it was quite low. But when you got near 1, the incidence of rectal bleeding went up to about uh, 5 to 10 percent. But that if you start to get about 1.5 to 2, you had a marked increase right about uh, the 1.8 range you could see that curve go up to about a 25 percent incidence of rectal bleeding. Others have um, replicated this. So clearly, there's a dose-response relationship uh, in prostate brachytherapy uh, with rectal bleeding. So for this particular uh, genetic study, we looked at um, the ATM uh, status, and what we found, uh, something that was, it was quite interesting, that the if you looked at the entire group of patients, the relationship between the rectal volume receiving the prescription dose um, and the incidence of rectal bleeding was quite similar in this uh, another cohort of patients, and that's the red line. But if you looked at the yellow line, those patients that had the ATM alteration, they, they, they began to have rectal bleeding at much lower volumes of rectal receiving RV100. So you can see that their rectal bleeding rate is almost 20 percent, even at 0.7 cc's uh, RV100. And, and then uh, on the other side, 
The flip side was that patients that didn't have the ATM mutation could go kind of all the way out to about uh, one and a half cc's without really getting uh, uh, rectal bleeding, but as their rect uh, uh, then we hit a threshold point when then the rectal bleeding rate went up. But it was interesting that clearly uh, the, the status here of the ATM gene did, uh, did affect the incidence of rectal bleeding. And then uh, since that time, we began to look at uh, some other genes uh, related to uh, radio sensitivity. I uh, said TGF beta, XRCC1, SOD2. And then we published a page, this particular paper looking at the TGF uh, beta1 single uh, or SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, and its association with adverse quality of life in prostate cancer patients treated with radi uh, radiotherapy. And this graph just shows you that if you had a, a, a SNP for the TGF beta 1, you had a 50% chance of having a marked decline in erectile dysfunction compared to an overall, the overall population of 33% in decline in erectile dysfunction. Uh, and then a lower rate if you had no evidence of the SNP at 24%. In terms of rectal bleeding, the TGF beta uh, SNP also did predict for an, uh, increased rectal bleeding with a 55% rate of rectal bleeding in those patients, uh, six out of 11 that had this SNP versus the overall population of 28%. And in the univariate analysis, you can see that the, the T, in this particular analysis, the TGF beta 1 SNP was uh, the most significant predictor uh, of toxicity in terms of erectile dysfunction. In terms of rectal bleeding, again, the TGF beta uh, SNP, this particular SNP also was the most significant predictor of uh, rectal bleeding. And this is just another uh, analysis that we did looking at um, some of these uh, SNPs uh, and, and other radio, uh, uh, radiation related toxicity. And again, you can see in this particular case, which as, as I'm going to begin to show you, as you combine the various SNPs, uh, just like the, uh, the genomic test that we saw, your incidence of the toxicity increased. And same thing here, looking at patients with erectile dysfunction. So in reality, we were wondering, is it, can it be that simple? And the answer, of course, is that uh, it is not. Uh, and then again, that the issue is that the co combined genetic analysis is more predictive than a single uh, gene model. And this is a uh, 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 Jan Overgaard's study looking at radiation fibrosis in patients that got radiation post-mastectomy. And you can see from the graph on the bottom that as the number of risk alleles that you had increased from two to three, four to five, and six to seven, the amount of radiation that you needed to actually cause that toxicity decrease. So and essentially, as the number of risk alleles increase, um, the, the greater likelihood that given that you, if you're given a, do, a particular dose, that you're going to develop toxicity. So uh, at Mount Sinai, we started something based on that called the, uh, the Gene Par Project, Genetic Predictors of Adverse Radiotherapy Effects. Um, this is just some of the funding for the study. And basically, we started to, uh, as you heard from one of the other uh, tests, uh, the, the Cypher test, we used genome-wide genome, genome -wide screening, so screening the entire genome. This is very different from what we had been doing before, looking just at a few select uh, SNPs. Now we were screening the entire uh, genome for uh, uh, SNPs that may be associated uh, with various toxicities. So this particular paper, one of the first ones, is that we looked at um, the relationship between this GWAS, we called it analysis, and uh, erectile dysfunction, and we focused for this particular because of the funding in African American men. And again, we started to do these uh, receiver operator curves that you, you've heard so much about as their ability to predict for the toxicity. And again, what you can see from that graph, uh, the closer uh, the, the level is to one, uh, the greater the predictive value of this. Um, and you can see from this graph that the genetic model uh, was much more predictive than a clinical model. Uh, this was another uh, paper we looked at using the GWAS. Uh, analysis looking at the development of rectile function in, in a general population of patients. And again, what we did in this particular analysis is we looked at clinical variables that could affect uh, the toxicity that we were looking at, and then we looked at the effect of having these uh, SNPs and then a combination of both. And you can see from the receiver operator curve that the pink line or the, uh, had, the, had basically the greatest predictive value in, in predicting this particular toxicity. So as you heard, really paralleling, although completely different, because now we're looking at toxicity, that genetics with what we already know to be clinically important 
seems to be the best way uh, to go forward with this types, these types of analysis. So this is, one of the, this is a, another one of the studies that we looked at, looking at the effect doing these GWAS analysis on rectal bleeding following radiation. And the conclusions were that the G, GWAS identified certain novel genetic markers uh, of rectal bleeding following post-radiation therapy. And again, the goal of all this was eventually, and still is, to create a predictive assay that can really identify patients uh, with that have really enhanced uh, risk for radiation-related uh, toxicity. Just another paper we did uh, on this particular topic, uh, looking at um, the SNPs and associated with urinary symptoms. In this particular analysis, this is just the type of uh, urinary symptoms that we saw after brachytherapy. And uh, as you can see here, that the, the changes were much greater in patients that had the risk genotype in urinary symptoms than those with a non-risk genotype. And so finally, I'd like to end on this last thing, which was, was basically what we had, had taken, what we had done with the Gene Par project. Barry Rosenstein and Sarah Kearns led this, these projects and basically got some other groups um, to do a meta-analysis of GWAS-associated studies, which will identify genetic markers of late toxicity following radiation. So here are the, uh, you can see on the bottom is uh, the four groups. There's a group from Cambridge uh, that had 700 patients that got radiation therapy, um, external beam radiation therapy, and looked at their toxicities. Uh, the Radiogen, uh, which is a, uh, a, a Spanish group that had 741 patients. The Gene Par Project from Mount Sinai, 895 patients. Um, and um, uh, Alberta, Canada, uh, with a, a cohort of 155 patients. So this was just a meta-analysis. Looking at all this, here are some of the toxicity scores for the various groups. I know there's a lot of information, in it, and it can be quite... Uh, Difficult to remember all this stuff. Uh, but basically, the, the, the meta-analysis identified two SNPs, uh, which were associated with uh, increase in urinary frequency. Um, and it was interesting that these SNPs lie within genes that did express tissues adversely affected by pelvic radiation, including the bladder, kidney, rectum, and small intestine. Uh, and it did prove that the results show that a heterogeneous radiotherapy cohorts can be combined to identify uh, a new penetrance model. So essentially, what this is telling us is we're on our way to this, but unlike some of the tests that are already in clinical practice, I don't think we're, we're there yet. But uh, you can see this is very, very complex. But I think the more patients we get in these large meta-analysis, the better way are going to be to fine tune uh, uh, a particular type of assay that we can really give to patients and, and really try to weed out those patients that really are at a very enhanced risk for uh, radiation toxicity. Thank you.